Whitaker. I'm the screens editor for the Austin Chronicle. Um, I've been the editor for a year, but I've been covering film on and off for about 20 years. Um, which now I think about it is depressing. Um, okay, the title tonight is How to Touch Journalists at Parties, or Some Quick and Easy Ways to Improve Your Chances of Getting Press Coverage. There are no guarantees. Um, Let's take South by Southwest. Uh, there, by the time we finished the, the booking, there will be about 130 films in total. Um, there will be mm, probably another 200 or so shorts. Um, and even with all the journalists in the world, not everything gets covered. It's just impossible. Um, but you can do things that help you stand out in the crowd a little bit. Um, and that's really what I'm going to try to help you with this evening, and just kind of give you some pointers from my side of the, of the world. Um, first things first, how many people are actually filmmakers at any level? Good, that's most of you. Uh, any journalists here by any chance? Because a couple might have been making it. <laughs> Good, I can talk shit about it. <laughs> um, how many of you have at least one short that you've made? How many have made a, a feature of some variety or are working on a feature? Great. So hopefully this will be really, really useful. Um, OK. Before we start, uh, what is the most accurate film about journalism, particularly when it comes to day-to-day -to -day grunt journalism? Is it A, All the President's Men, Aldo Pacula, 1976. Great movie. Great movie. Not saying anything bad about it. Spotlight, um, Tom McCarthy, 2015, the Oscar winner. Uh, Great analysis by the, about what the Boston Globe did to uh, get to the root of um, uh, clerical abuse in Boston. Fantastic film. If you haven't seen it, then I'd be shocked. Or, almost famous, Cameron Crowe, 2000. Guesses. Almost famous. Yes, you know why it's the best film about journalism? I actually had a clip here, uh, but we couldn't make it work because technology is not my friend. Um, it's Lester Bangs explaining to the young Cameron Crowe that a lot of what you do as a journalist is hang around, you're really badly paid, uh, it's boring, <laughs> occasionally something cool and interesting happens, and then you have to go home and write about it. Journalists are not cool. We are never cool. This is the, the first thing. <laughs> so, the first question you should ask yourself when, you're, when you have a film to publicize is, should I get a PR person? Before you start anything else, you should ask yourself that. Because you can do a lot, we'll get into what you can do. But if you go, I want to make my film, I want to concentrate on my film, and I don't really want to get into the PR side of things, it's not something I do. You, know, you have to ask yourself that question. So, negatives of getting a PR person, or contracting one out, they cost money, they don't know my project, and you're not their only client. They will care about you. If you get a good PR firm, and there are lots of them, there's lots of independent ones in town who can do, who will take on single projects and they'll really commit to it. Um, and then the thing of, well, I'll be doing some of the work myself anyway. So you'll be doing the interviews. They'll be asking you to provide still. So you'll still be doing some work. So it's kind of, you, you've got to balance the work there. And again, we'll come into that. Positives of just getting a PR person from day one, they'll do a lot of the work for you. Um, that's why you're paying them. Uh, they have contacts you don't, and probably never will, because this isn't what you do. You're not a PR person. So they know all the people they want to talk to. They've got contact with all the journalists. I'm on first name terms with PR people in New York just because they're in town twice a year, and they go, oh, I've got a film opening in Austin. I'll call Richard. So they have contacts. That's all done for you. Um, and most of all, it's what they do. If they're good at it, they will promote your film. They'll do all the work for you. So you've got to work out Taking these, all this into account, is this worth my time? Can I afford them? Will they do the work I do? Is this what I want from them? If you decide you just want to hire a PR firm and let them do it for you and tell you what you need to do, fine. That's what most filmmakers do, and they do it for a reason. It worked. It's very effective. But you can do a lot of this yourself. So, but before you decide on anything, if you go with a PR firm, before you sign a contract, and this is real nuts and bolts stuff. Have a very clear idea of the scope of work. So, for example, a lot of people hire a PR company or a rep for a festival run 
or just freedom for one festival. So, for example, uh, Fonz PR in town, they do a lot of work with Fantastic Fest. They also do a lot of work with individual Fantastic Fest titles just for the run of the festival. So you're not necessarily taking on a PR firm for all time. It may just be, hey, I've got into this festival. Can you come on board for this three-week period? Do the outreach. Do the announcements. Make sure that you know what you're getting from. Are you hiring the complete run? You may well be. If you're doing any kind of self-distribution, you may want to get a PR firm that does everything. You may want to get somebody where the instant you sell the film or get some kind of distribution, you hand it off to the distributor, and they'll do all the PR work for you. Um, what exactly are they providing? What are they promising? This is like any other contract. You just need to make sure that you know what you are expecting from them, so you don't go to them and say, hey, you didn't do this, and they go, well, that's not a contract. Uh, know how much you're paying for how long, and know what they'll ask of you. If you go in, they're going to say, well, we need stills. We need, do you have a finished film? Do you have a screener available? Who do you want to make that available to? These are questions that you have to work out on a case by case basis with the PR. If you've decided you want to promote it, or at least that it's in the back of your mind, you're thinking like, you know, I made a film from scratch. I wrote a script. I wrangled a lot of people. Is it really that hard? OK. This is a guy called Ted Geek. Uh I've known Ted for, he's going to hate, he hates this headshot. He really <laughs> hates this headshot. Because <laughs> it, makes it, it makes him look slightly annoyed, like he's just remembered he left the kettle off. Um, Ted. Uh, directed uh, We Are Still Here, which played South by a few years ago. It was a great horror film. Uh, he also directed Mohawk, uh, which is a historical thriller. These are both great films. I'm not saying that just because I know Ted, but they really are great indie films. Really beats the retro. I got to know Ted not as a director, but as a PR guy for other people's films. He would always be in town, he'd be mailing me, and he'd say, I'm doing this, and then I, then I heard that he had We Are Still Here was finished, and I was like, I didn't know you made films. And he was like, I, that's literally what I do. PR is my side gig. And I was like, oh. Uh, this is what Ted told me one time, because um, he's from the Midwest. And he said, when I moved out to New York, I had quite a few people here meet me and be surprised. They'd say, I know who you are. Who's your publicist? I don't feel like, like I should know you from any of the projects you've been involved with, so you must have a really good publicist. Well, I don't, so I guess I'm my own publicist. Now, this is the important bit. While the majority of directors I know have a day job, it doesn't happen to be in the film industry. They work in an office or a restaurant. It just so happens that mine is in film. And his day job in film is PR. So how many filmmakers here have a day job? Wow, there's some lucky filmmakers here who don't. That's awesome. Are you unemployed or are you full-time filmmakers? Full-time. Excellent. Love hearing this. Awesome. Oh, well. This makes me so happy when I yeah. see it can happen. For anybody out there going, like, is this ever going to happen? I own public relations for about 15 years. Excellent. Thank you. Do you have any, anything else? I was going to accost you right when you came up just to kind of make a point and go, ah, here I am. Ah, exactly. Always carry cards. Rule number one of PR or any kind of promotion. <laughs> always carry cards. A lot of people go, oh, I don't need cards. It's like, yeah, you do. You really do. Because two months after any festival, I will be going through the pockets of this jacket and I'll go, Oh, yeah, huh, there. Visual aid, they look like this, and yeah, some that's of red on them. That's very handy. Oh, and not on in Greek. <laughs> See, now in two months' time, you're going to reach into this pocket, and I'm going to go, Tom McPhee, man smiling, move, moving pictures. Well, I'm hoping you're going to be back for my whip at the end of March for my film Rough Life, a feature. See, <laughs> this, is, this is the object lesson. Always be promoting. It's like always be closer, but it's always be promoting. If there's people there who want to hear about your film, talk to them about it. It's the, the, like, never be shy about your film, ever. So, this keys into this. You are your own best publicist. You know your film. You know your project. You know what market you're trying to reach. So let's do, use a few examples. Uh, Jim Cummings, uh, Thunder Road, did fantastically at South by Southwest last year. Uh, could not get a distribution deal worth so Jim went to Sundance Labs and said, OK, well, I know you've got this new project where you're pushing people to self-release. 
and he made his he made three times his budget back in France alone before his US release. This was a case of he believed that what he had to do was invest his time and his effort into promoting the film, into handling the distribution. Yes, he had some dance at his back, but this has become an indie success and he's made all his money on it. Um, American the Bill Hicks story, another South by Five from a few years ago. Uh, I talked to the filmmakers about this and they went, well, we finished the film and the film was a project we really believed in. We weren't interested in moving on to another project, so we budgeted out how much time can we spend promoting it and it came to a point where they couldn't afford to have both of them out on the road promoting it, so one of the directors went back to his day job, the other one stayed on the project. Again, this is about time commitment and sweat equity at the end of the day. And uh, Attack of the Demons, which is a local director called Eric Power, um, who's an animator. Uh, he does stop motion, he does paper animation, and he promotes his films himself a lot because nobody knows how to handle stop motion animation or any kind of um, yeah, any kind of independent animation. So he does a lot of promotion. The reason I found out that he had this film was that he emailed. So basic, so simple, but he was like, yeah, I need to talk to the local press because nobody else is going to do it for me. Uh, okay, here's the bit where we make this less scary because I know I'm not scary. Film journalists, we are just like independent filmmakers. We're usually badly paid. Uh, we work weird hours. Uh, we do it because we love it. Film reporters want to report about film. That may sound really stupid, but nobody writes about film to get rich. We really don't. I mean, the, the number of people who go, oh great, Shout Factory sent me a bunch of free DVDs, straight onto eBay, uh, is absurd. Um, particularly Shout Factory, because they're always really valuable, and they never cut their prices. So. Um, the other one also is, like, if there's free food, journalists will be there. <laughs> Much like any other kind of that you're on that. So, let's say that you decided, yeah, I want to do some or all of the promotion myself. You have a film. You want to start the outreach to journalists. Work out who you want to talk to. It sounds simple, but you need to sit down and go, who's the list of people I need to be in contact? Work out who is doing the talking. Again, this sounds really simple, but you need to go, well, is it one of the producers who's, do, who's going to do this? Is there an assistant we're going to have? With? Is there somebody involved with the production? Who is the point of contact? It's like anything else. There has to be one person who everything goes to. It's a process. Thing. It's like anything else. And I know some of this sounds really obvious, but the number of times I've seen people make really basic mistakes where I get a press release and they go, oh, yeah, I know I sent you the press release, but you don't really need to talk to me. And I'm like, well, that's two more phone calls, and I'm going to work out. Uh, OK, yeah, just, oh, thanks. I've got 10 other films to deal with. So something like this is just about taking a barrier out of the way of you communicating with journalists. Work out what you want to tell them. Again, <laughs> this sounds really simple. But these are the places where people fall down. What is it you're trying to communicate at any one point in time? And this is the core bit, because you're not really talking to the journalist. The journalist at the end of the day, and I know this is my job, is to be the person who gets what you want to tell audiences to your potential audience. We're just an intermediary. So the relationship at the end of the day is with the journalist, but it's to get past them. It's to talk to their audience. So if somebody talks to me, it's not really talking to me. It's talking to the 90,000 people who pick up a copy of the Chronicle every week. That's who your target is. So that's what you've always got to keep in, in mind uh, when you're going like, well, what do we want to know? Is this something they'll care about? That's something we'll talk about later. First of all, work out who you want to talk to, or a wasted email is wasted time. Um, a lot of times, emails just go to the wrong place. And they'll go to the right publication, but this is literally people, and this is just in the last few weeks, um, people who 
at the Chronicle who have got press releases meant for me, and they forwarded them to me because they were like, I think this is you. I'm not sure this is you, but I'm fairly sure this is you. Uh, the news editor, the arts editor, and the IT department. Uh, for some unknown reason, the IT guy gets a lot of film-related uh, stuff. He has no idea why. And I'll just get these forward and he's like, I'm pretty sure they really, this, this is not, they don't really want me to go see their film. And very nice if they do, I think they really want you to. People I have received press releases from just in the few, last few weeks. Walk in back home, please. Dildo manufacturers, this happens a lot. Um, I'm not sure whose list I'm on. <laughs> Or why? But, and Texans were going out. So, which is, you know, walking bath company is like probably top of the list here. <laughs> Services I might have been used this week. I don't know. I can't get that um, so, this is a simple one how to find the right person. You're probably looking for the screens editor or the film desk editor uh, or reviewers or film writers. Sometimes you're also looking for uh, freelancers who work for a publication regularly, because if you mail them, they'll mail me and go, hey, somebody contacted me. They've got a film. They've got a short film. They're working on a game. They're doing something. And they'll bother me until I tell them, like, write about it and I'll pay you. So freelancers are also a good access point. So simple ways to find the right person to talk to, so you're not wasting your energy. Check the master. Who here knows what the master is? So a half hand, I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> Masthead, when you open something like the Chronicle, you'll see a list, and it's got publication data, and who's who. Uh, who's the editor, who's the publisher, full, full staff list. That's the masthead. So check that. Literally, in the Chronicle, you just pick it, open, pick it up. It's usually page five. So you'll just go, oh, that's who works for the Chronicle. That's who I want to talk to. The masthead is your first point, just for checking. Quite often, there'll be a contact list uh, on the website. Make sure, again, you're contacting the right people. Is there an editor? Uh, editors are the third, you know, they, at the end of the day, are going to tell writers who to cover. Because writers don't usually have that much leeway unless it's a really small publication. So they're going to go to their editor and say, hey, there's this story. Somebody's got a new film. Somebody's just started shooting usually go to the editor, but also specific journalists. If there's somebody who you see doing a lot, uh, again, this is similar to the stuff, but it's, these are the basic points that people fall over time and time again. Are there specific journalists? So the Chronicle, we've got a lot of reviewers. Uh, we've got staff writers. We don't have a dedicated film staff writer other than me, but we have some people who do specifically tackle film once in a while, but they'll do five or six other topics. So look back at their clippings and go, is this somebody I need, really need to write? Is it worth email? Are there journalists I've worked with before? This is a big one. If you've got a contact, use it. But do they still work there? Um, again, this, what this creates is kind of two divergent paths. Say you've worked with me in the past. I wrote about your first film, or your first short, or you did a music video of somebody, and I wrote something about it. And I've left the Chronicle, and I've gone to work for the Poughkeepsie Monitor. Probably a real publication, I don't know. Um, they have papers in Poughkeepsie, I'm fairly sure. So treat that as an opportunity. Don't go, oh, damn, they've left. Go, OK, there's probably somebody who's replaced Richard. I should mail them. But then also, I'll mail it at the Poughkeepsie Monica, Monitor. See whether he's interested up there. He might not be. Take everything as an option. Maybe again, it comes back to, am I talking to the right person? OK. What does the reporter need? <coughs> this is what our thinking is. I come into work on any one day, and I'm like, I'm looking for stories. What do I want to write about? Uh, relevance. This is the big one. And this will come up a lot. Relevance is, it's actually a communications theory thing that I could go into for way too long. I am really not going to. But it's like, why should I care? That's what it boils down to. How is this relevant to my readers? How is it relevant to our publication? What is it that this adds to my paper, or to my website, or to my publication, or to my TV station? 
Images. <laughs> this may sound again really obvious. The number of times <laughs> I've gone, hey, do you have any stills? And they're like, ah, I, I can get you something. <laughs> <laughs> OK, call me when you have. Because again, it's all about time. Access. Who are they talking to? You know, if you send me a press release and then you're like, ah, I don't really don't want to talk to you. I'm like, well, good, thank you for sending me a press release. It goes with the $50,000. And time to write and report. This is a big one. Okay. Here is the cycle of reporting. I'm sorry, the graphics aren't more exciting. It's like, I just. Journalists. <laughs> <laughs> <Sure, that's laughs> the design part of the problem is If he'd have called us, we could have. First contact. I just had a rocket here. That would have been awesome. <laughs> first contact is however you reach out. The first contact is we're at an event and you go, hey, I hear you work at the Chronicle, I've got a film. Or you send a press release. Or you send me, a, you, know, you follow me on Twitter and it's really obvious that you're a film account. In which case, I'll always follow you back. Or you cost the journalist at a speaking engagement. There you go. Or you heckled in the cheap seat. One of them. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to forget that. No, no, no. <laughs> I also bring them out for a wrestling promotion, so I'm, I'm used to dealing with the front row. Uh, <laughs> this is a true story. Um, you know, you can invite me to be your friend on Facebook. You know, particularly for a film project, I'm going to go, oh, okay, yeah, and I'll, I'll see what they're doing. So any kind of outreach, that's, what, that's it. Then the editor contacts the reporter, or the reporter contacts the editor. Then the piece is commissioned. I tell them, you know, in my case, I find one of my writers and go, write this. And they go, OK, are you paying me? And I go, yes. And they go, OK. <laughs> the piece is written. Magic happens in here, by the way. This is just <laughs> pure magic where they come and they talk to you. And it's just a glorious conversation. And you spill your guts about how the film was made and everything that's glorious. And it's the best piece of journalism in the history of the world. So that happens like there. <laughs> there. Then the piece comes to the editor, and the editor goes, oh, God, I wish I had a writer that could write. Um, <laughs> the, yeah. A lot of, of uh, writers, uh, this is just me fetching as an editor, a lot of writers will go, well, yeah, I know you told me to do a 1,000 words, but here, here's two and a half thousand. Um, and I'm like, yeah, no. And it's often like a work print. It's like the film is in there somewhere. And you cut it down, and you go, well, OK, that was the bits that mattered. So that's just editorial bitching about writers. <laughs> Not just in public, and I can complain more. Uh, the piece is published. The piece is read. And that's when audiences know about your phone. Remember what I said, what, the, what really matters is that point of communication? All this is process. All this is about getting to them. OK. So. This is a real nuts and bolts question. How long does that process take? It's usually between most circumstances about 10 days and about 30 days. Um, think of it as an egg hatching. So 10 days uh, is uh, how long it takes for a platypus egg to hatch. Um, and 30 days is a Muscovy duck. So I just love Muscovy. That was nice. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, you need to, when you're planning contact, you need to think in that kind of period ahead. Particularly if you're going, OK, how do I get some advanced coverage? Think about reaching out a month or more in advance. Don't call me the day before you've got your first screening and go, I've got a screening tomorrow. Good. Carry on with your life and call me when you give me time. Because that's just, like I said, Let's just go back to that. This is just a process. This is what everybody will go through. It's really hard to do anything faster than that. Um, the most annoying thing for a reporter is when somebody sends you a press release and it's like, oh, this is happening now. Good. Doesn't do you any favors. So keep that in mind. I have a question. Yes. Um, if, if a story was published and the Filmmaker reaches out maybe like three months down the road. Do you ever release data about viewership? No. Okay. No. Um, 
no publication will will do that. Um, it's proprietorial. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we're in competition with other people. Uh, we're like Netflix. It's just a <laughs> viewing figures black box. Um, so, you know, with the Chronicle, uh, you can do things like when we on the front page, we have our most read stories, um, our most view, our most shared, uh, and our most commented stories. So you can kind of get an indication there, but nobody, nobody in the industry talks about uh, how many people have read something, because quite, and particularly in print, we don't know. I mean, we'll know online, but then. The difference between readership for a story online and who's going to pick it up in print, it's surprisingly different. Um, that's, uh, that is a grand mystery we've never solved. But yeah, it's, it's kind of regarded as rude <laughs> to ask about, uh, oh, you know, and it will be the classic, you know, oh no, your story did well. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Or we're going to give it another push. Uh, or you're going to hold, or occasionally you're going to, holy crap! Everybody read this. What the hell was that? Why are you like? Which is always great, but it is like the uh, a uh, Macon Blair told a story to continue the Netflix allegory um, when uh, he uh, sold um, I don't feel at home in this world anymore to Netflix. Uh, he asked them, "Was like, well, how did it do?" And this was actually at an AFS uh, screening last year. He said, "Yeah, how did it do?" And they went, "Oh, it did really well." Really well for a sub-million dollar indie? Or really well for James Cameron? It did really well. And that's the only answers you'll get. So and that's kind of like giving the journals. Mainly because we don't know most of the time either. So when you're talking to journalists, what are you talking? First thing, hi, my film exists. <coughs> Great. Good for you. Hi, my film exists, and I would love to talk to you about it. So would everybody. Hi, my film exists, and here's why it's relevant to you and your audience. This is just crafting a message. This is about going, okay, say with me, um, the big selling point for any film or any project is it's locally made. That's something I really try and emphasize, is you know, it's an Austin project, it's a short, it's a web series, it's locally made, I can try and increasingly do set visits, this enemy shooting, and is doing a set visit, call me. I will turn up. That's one of those things I can turn up fast for and just like drop everything and come by. That is never, ever an issue. But you've got, the, it's that, yeah, it's the relevance word. Why should that reporter care? So, yes. The winner is, my film exists, and here's why it's relevant to you and your audience. That's the response you want from the journalist. Because they're going to care, you know, like I said earlier, film reviewers, film reporters, film writers want to write about film. There's so many press releases I get on a daily basis. What's the selling point that makes me go, oh, okay, no, you move up the stack a little bit. Okay. Ways to make your film relevant to reporters. Uh, for me, local news, local connection. That's a big deal. At any point in production, I'm going to go, OK, a film is shooting in Austin. I automatically care. Somebody's doing a short. Somebody started a web series. Automatically, I care, so it's on my list. It, that's, but that's me. Timeliness. Is something happening with your film? Say you've just gone into a festival. Doesn't even need to be in Austin. If you haven't picked up this week's Chronicle, blatant plug, uh, we have the. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have uh, the ATX Film News column. One of the things I've got in there is a list of filmmakers that, and films from Austin or with an Austin connection that have got into either Sundance, Slamdance, um, or Big Scott. And that's press. You know, it doesn't seem like it's a lot of press. I just go, OK, Sea Drift got into Slamdance. But that's the start of the press. That's the start of recognition of like, oh, we've got a film and it's happening. So time limits. If you've got something happening, tell people. This is another one. Specialty publications. Uh, genre and subject matter. Um, some genres, there are a lot of specialty publications, publications and websites. Horror is knee deep. Um, there are some Western ones. There are all kinds of specialty ones. Rom-coms. Romance is a little tougher. Um, 
but you can find things. Subject matter as well. It doesn't have to be the genre, but the subject matter. So to boil this down, why would my audience want to read this? Well, it depends who my audience is. Because you can find your way into any kind of publication if you want. This is Woodworker's Journal, <laughs> which is a real thing. It is a very respected woodworking publication, which ran an article about Jesse Ventura's film Woodshop. They interviewed the director. Now, the thing is that this is a film about Jesse Ventura in a woodshop. Fair enough. But it was an audience that a lot of people come, well, why would I talk to a woodshop publication? Well, if your audience, if potential audience is woodworkers, or a part of your potential audience is woodworkers, absolutely. But always take that into account. Is there somebody who's not a film journalist that might be interested? So over the past few years, there have been a lot of uh, documentaries on education and education policy. Film reporters are interested in that, but so are education reporters. And you'll see a lot of, a lot of coverage from people who are, have an education beat that are covering those kind of films, or foreign policy. Or, you, know, you can always find somebody outside of film reporting who might be interested. And that's another person to reach out to. OK, so the most common way to talk to anybody in the media is a press release. Um, Take it to basics. This is a really simple thing. They're usually about one page, maybe two. Um, the, quick, the best thing to do is to both uh, attach them to the email as a, uh, a PDF, but also embed it into, just cut and paste it into the email as well. Uh, that's a simple thing, but you'd be surprised a number of people go, here's my press release, and you're like, ah, uh, you forgot to attach it. Oh, it's a PDF at the bottom. You forgot to attach the PDF. This is, again, things that have really happened to me. And it's another thing that slows down your processing. In the press release, the absolute basics. Contact details, release details, synopsis. Synopsis is really important. Um, like you would for a festival submission, just put the synopsis in there. Just a three, four sentence brief version that you cut and paste in. Uh, cast and crew. Uh, this doesn't need to be a, you know, 20 pages on everybody involved. They don't need their entire life story, but they need to be able to go, oh, they were, that's such and such. They were involved in projects such and such. I remember that. Just enough to spark some recognition in the reporter, because they're not going to spend all day reading. And it's, you may have seen sometimes you get press notes for a film, and they'll be like this thick. The only thing they are useful for is killing time while you're waiting for an interview. That's it. Uh, after that, you're kind of wasting your own time. And if, the, if you're doing self-promotion, wasting time is the worst thing. Uh, IMDB page, just put the link, make sure it's in there. Uh, do you have screeners available? You may not. I generally, this is a weird one. Some people will just go, have a screen link. I'm like, I don't think that's a good idea. I think say, screen links are available on request. Part of the reason you should do that is that it forces the journalist to contact you. Now you've started a conversation. Because they're going to go, oh, can I see the film? And you can go, OK, I've got a rough cut. Please don't share this with anybody. And they'll go, don't worry, we won't share it with anybody. Uh, if anybody is concerned about piracy, there are almost no recorded cases of film piracy um, by film journalists. This never happens. You can trust us, because if we put something on Pirate Bay or on YouTube, that's our reputation completely killed, so it never happens. Uh, historically, it's always come from in-house. Piracy comes, pi the piracy calls are coming from in inside the house. So the screeners really do improve your, your chance of getting covered. Um, vital information. Uh, why should the reports care? We'll talk about this a lot, but I just wanted to reinforce this. And where in production are you? Have you just started production? Sometimes you want to do a press release about that, just saying, okay, we just started, we've got funding. Don't bombard people with a press release every time you, it's not a shooting diary, uh, but think, why will they care? Give them enough to keep them going. The five basic kinds of film story. Uh, again, going to the real basics. You're starting production. Set visits. I love set visits. A lot of reporters do, not least because it gets us out for the day and it's fun. 
uh, festivals. You've got into a festival. A lot of the PR will be handled by festivals themselves, but uh, you've got a release, or you're looking for a review. Now, these ones, first four, will be handled by reporters. The review will be handled by reviewers. These are often different people. Um, you know, so for example, the Chronicle, I do both. Uh, we have a few people who only review. Uh, so Marjorie Baumgarten, who was um, the editor for years, she just reviews now. She doesn't do any kind of reporting because it's not what she wants to do anymore, so she does review. But wait! If the first thing you do is send a press release, you're doing it wrong. I've had people send me press releases, and it's just like, here's a piece of paper with some vague facts on it. And I'm like, okay, where do I work from this from? Before you do anything, you send that press release in the background, it's like pre-production. Have a press kit set up. Have your online presence set up. Have your social media set up. Uh, Facebook, great for building communities. Uh, it also, it's also usually somewhere where I can grab images from, which is really helpful. Uh, Instagram, very pretty pictures. And Twitter. Twitter is film reporter crack. <laughs> it is our favorite thing in the world. Um, every film critic, every film writer has a Twitter account. Uh, we argue with each other over it. Uh, we publicize over it. If you don't have a Twitter account for your, your film and for yourself, Get one now. That is, on social media, that is the big thing. Uh, I mean, this is really helpful for you for audiences. Again, this is kind of like day-to-day, -day, really good fun stuff. But for dealing with reporters, Twitter, absolutely essential. Uh, if, you, if you go to a festival and you look down the line of people playing on their phones, if there are people on Twitter, I'm telling you now, they're journalists. Because we're like, what happened? What am I missing? Who am I arguing with? Whose review is wrong? Who should I shout out about class? Okay. <laughs> so I said the press kit. Uh, you need your press release, you need images, and usually a trailer is a good idea. Journalists like being able to embed video. Increasingly, we're under pressure to, you know, we've got past the horrible pivot to video thing that everybody was doing that drove a lot of people out of business. But we do like embedding trailers. Press release. What's happened? Again, relevance. This is a really, again, blinding the obvious one. Read it, read it, read it again. Give it to somebody else, have them read it, then take it back, read it again. The number of times I've had press releases, typos or errors, and it's a really simple thing. It's like having a typo in a resume. It just makes you look like, ah, are they really paying attention? It's a simple thing but it's the kind of thing that hurts your chances. Like I said at the beginning, this is all about improving your chances and getting rid of, of barriers. Images, very specific. Um, if you're doing, these are the options you really want to make sure you've got. Web, JPEG, yeah. Uh, usually something in the, uh, usually about 1,200 uh, pixel width is what most people are going to want because they can size down. Very few people run bigger than that. Much bigger than that, you're just putting a really big image attachment to the file. Uh, this is really simple stuff in a lot of ways, but a good sized image. I've, had, I've literally emailed people and said, hey, do you have an image for uh, your film? And they go, yeah, and they send me something the size of a postage stamp, and I'm like, no, not useful. Do you have something else? Oh, well, let me call the cinematographer, they may have something. It slows the process down. And I've got five other filmmakers calling me going, can you cover my film instead? And I'm like, okay, this goes to the back of the pile. It's just something you don't need. Uh, print, TIFF or a high-res JPEG? Uh, preferably TIFF. Uh, don't give people the, um, the high-res TIFF first off. They will usually ask you for it. Uh, because otherwise you're sending them a huge file and they're going like, oh god, I've got a 10 meg file in my email, god. Make a poster. Having a poster is really, really important. Um, and I will say this, I'll say this now for one reason. Portrait, not landscape. And this will become really, really obvious in a, in a few moments' time when I talk about something else. 
Minimum five, when you're setting it, minimum 500 by 7, uh, 750 pixels or about 2,000 by, three, uh, 2, by 3,000. Somewhere in that range. Not too big, again, you're not sending people a huge email. Uh, trails. This is a technical thing. Vimeo or YouTube? No, Vimeo and YouTube. Very simple reason why, and this is a technical thing. Um, most uh, publication websites are, to use a technical term, kludgy. They are very unstable, and sometimes they don't like particularly Vimeo. I know filmmakers love Vimeo. I love Vimeo. Vimeo is great. Vimeo sometimes has embed issues. So if you do a trailer, make sure it's on both Vimeo and YouTube. And I have, I've lost track of the number of times where I've, I've not seen it on both platforms. I find that baffling. They, it, you know, YouTube is free. It doesn't cost you anything to put your trailer up, so put your trailer on both. Make sure it's embeddable. Um, and clips sometimes. Um, that's a, a decision for you. If you want to put like a two minute clip online, that's fine. Uh, but in addition to your trailer, and sometimes in smaller films, they don't cut a trailer and they just go, here's our trailer. And it's actually two minute clip and you're kind of like, it's not really a trailer. And again, it's this little thing that makes the journalist go, so you don't have a trailer, but you don't know. Is this a, is this a real project? You've got to knock those little things out of the, uh, out of the, the, uh, the journalist's mind that are going to slow down the process you're getting covered. Okay. Online presence. Who here remembers what Friendster is? Old. Uh, <laughs> Friendster was, uh, was uh, Facebook before there was MySpace. Um, nobody talks of it anymore. Those that do make, also make jokes about uh, GeoCities, um, proving how old we really are. Find, find an age and relative to explain that joke to you. IMDB. Uh, reporters use IMDB all the time. This does a lot of your heavy lifting on your press release. So I talked about the press release earlier. If you've got that, you have everything really on the cast and crew side that you could put in a press release. So it saves you time and effort. Make sure you have an IMDb page. Again, it sounds simple, but the number of people who don't, or it's barely populated. You know, it's kind of like, it's got a title, and it's got a coming soon, and it's got a director, but it doesn't have cast, it doesn't have any images, it's not really helpful. And this is another thing that makes a film, that makes a film journalist go, ah, oh, God, I've not got any information on this. Now. This is really simple. Setting an IMDb page does not take long at all. Who's heard of the movie database? Okay. This is another site you really, really need. Uh, in the early days, IMDB, and I'm talking way back in the dim distance, uh, pre-Amazon when it was still basically an independent project. Um, IMDB, one of the great things about it was building lists and um, the, uh, the boards. Because it built a sense of community. Uh, the movie database really just strips everything down to movie information. There is nothing else there. It's just the film, the title, release dates. It's, it's like a, you visit the site and you go, this is really dull. And it's, it feels like IMDb, but not fun. Uh, and here's why it is useful. Letterboxed. Anybody here use Letterboxd? Yeah, get to know Letterboxd. These are the two sites that, you, that are so ignored by filmmakers because they don't know about them. Letterboxd is basically what the good bits of IMDb were. You can build lists. You input a film and you go, oh, I watched this film. It builds a list up. And you go, oh, that's really great. I've seen this film this year, or here's a list of films that I saw at festivals this year, or whatever it is. So it's great for building that. Letterboxd is uh, populated from the movie database. That's where they pull their data from. Why Letterboxd is important is because every film reporter I know uses Letterboxd. So at the end of the year, that's where we all go and we go, oh, what films did I watch this year? It's in my list. I know because I wrote it down in June. And 
we have that. So again, it keeps you in the journalist mind. And this is really, really easy. MovieDB, really easy to use. Letterbox, really easy to use. And just generally, I think it's a good site. I think it's, it's IMDB without the bullshit or, or Amazon embedded uh, advertising. Social media, which we talked about before. Get these set up. These are all things that film reporters use because we are desk monkeys. We spend most of our time either sat on our computer, traveling to screenings, being in screenings, or traveling back to our computer. That's what we do. So where everybody in film journalism spends a lot of their life online. So that's a lot of what you can do here just makes it easier. You don't even need to write a press release at that point. You know, to a certain degree, for, for a lot of this stuff. And get your own damn website. Get a website. When you feel your film is far enough along, get a website. They're cheap. Build them yourselves. Not only is it general publicity, but again, filmmaker, film journalists can go to it and go, oh, okay, well, here's where they're in production. Keep it updated. This is a small thing, but again, you'd be amazed at the number of people who go, oh, well, I've got a Facebook page. Well, yeah, that's good, but you need a website as well because that's the kind of resource that filmmakers like going to. Mainly because Facebook can end up unnavigable. Having your own website gives you a lot more control. Is this the movie DNB that you were talking about? Yep, that is the movie DB. It's dot .org. Don't know how much it. Yes. Uh, see, this is why I need proof. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's the movie DB dot, dot .org. It is invaluable for journalists, which means it's a tool for you to get to them. Okay, common mistakes that people make. This is just to wrap this up. Um, when we talked about the time frame, sending things too late. No contact detail. If I don't know who I'm talking to, I can't get back to you. Can't get images. Can't reinforce this. Enough. Film is a visual medium. So if you give me images I can work with, I'm more likely to go, oh, okay. And I'll give you a really simple example on this. Um, I got the South by Southwest uh, press release of the first wave of films on Tuesday night for publication on Wednesday. I got the embargo push because they, they, they afforded me really nice. So uh, I get the list and there's 102 films in there. And I start Googling to see, okay, well, here's this film. Is there an image there? Because I want to put an image in the store. Okay, they don't have any images on that. They haven't put any images on their uh, IMDb page. They don't have anything, they don't have any stills on their Facebook page. They don't have a website. Okay, move along. I move along and I move along until I find films that have got images online that I can use. Then at the end of the day, that's the films, that's the projects where people go, they're reading through, they're scrolling through a list of 102 films, they go, oh, what's that? That's a pretty picture. Images available, it's a to not have something online that journalists can go and grab is self-sabotage. Um, I see it all the time, and there were a bunch of film. I literally, uh, I think it was the vision section, and I had to go through eight films before I found a single one with an image online. So like your film is screening in two months' time. Don't tell me you don't have an image. So the eighth film I came to, that's the one I used the image for. You know, it's, it's really simple stuff, but make sure images are available. And this one, no credit for photos. Um, every reporter alive at some point has got an angry phone call going, hey, you used my photo without credit. You owe me money. That is the worst sentence they've got here, because I'm going to explain to their editor. So, if you have behind the scenes photography, Make sure the journalist knows who to credit that to. This, is, this sounds like a small thing, but it's the kind of thing that's in the back of your mind the first time that you, you, you get caught, dragged over the coals by your editor because suddenly a photo you thought was going to be free because it was on somebody's website, now you're paying 300 bucks for it. So that's just a little thing, but that's the kind of thing that really, really screws you over again. So if you know, just say, hey, if you're on these photos, please make sure, make sure to credit such and such. With stills, that's not an issue. Stills are fine, but behind the scenes, or set photography, or like red carpet photography, make sure that we know who the credits are, make sure that you have the right to use that photograph. 
So for example, if you were at a festival, you don't automatically have the right to use the red carpet photography unless the festival agrees to let you use it. Because I, as a reporter, don't want an angry call from, from the festival going like, why did you use our photo? And, blah, blah, blah. and like, I don't know. Somebody put it on the filmmakers. Um, <laughs> so that's basically what it is. There's these things that you can do. There's these simple steps of taking into account. When do I need to reach out? What is it I'm trying to get the journalist to pick up on? What information do they need? What can I give them that's going to make my, my film stand out from the pack to get initial coverage? And then when they're doing coverage, that my story is going to be the one where they go, oh, OK, I'm going to give you more space. You're going to get a bigger picture. It's all about increasing your odds. And that's all, this, all I've tried to explain to you this evening. So to quote Blade Runner, questions? <laughs> You first. Yes. Uh, can we have access to this PowerPoint? Uh, yeah, I'll, um, I'll make sure that I'll get it to AFF and, uh, and uh, they will uh, uh, make it available for anybody. And I think this is being recorded as well. <laughs> <laughs> All my sins. Yeah. I'm really, really sorry about my rambling. Uh, yeah, let's say you're early in your festival run and you have festivals that you uh, apply to their fall of next year and likely you'll be self-distributing on Amazon or somewhere, like, and that would be even like, probably like three months after that. I mean, when would you reach out to do fresh lists? I know, like, let's say the local ones you get into, hit those up when you hit the festival, but in terms of after that, would you want to try to do some kind of press release when you do have it up on Amazon? Yes. OK. Uh, absolutely. Um, particularly if you've talked to a journalist in the past. Um, because here's what they're thinking. Hey, that film that I wrote about six months ago, that's on Amazon now. I can write something about that and go, hey, here's the longer story about it. So it's a twofer, oh, okay. because we get to republicize an older story. <laughs> so actually, yeah, it's a really, really, really good idea. Uh, plus, you've got a lot of places where they're basically just going, They'll do columns where they just say, here's what's coming on Amazon this week. And you see that all the time. And like, here's what's coming onto Amazon. Here's what's coming to Netflix. Here's what's leaving Netflix. You know, here's what's been canceled. Here's what's been picked up. So if there's something noteworthy, and particularly if it's somebody you've worked with before, a reporter that you've worked with before, and they wrote something about it, they want to do follow-up. Not least because a lot of the time they want to know that films that they wrote about have done well. Um, what would you say the, the key milestones would be? Your, your the key the milestones or? would be um, festivals. That's really that's a really key one. Uh, any kind of release, any kind of distribution. Uh, if you, you know, particularly, so basically festivals. If, if you've announced that you're getting that you've gone to a festival, that's a good one. Um, particularly because normally that'll be far enough in advance that people can start planning and go, oh yeah, they got into fest they got into AFF. Ah, huh, okay, yeah. And I, I will tell you this now because this is something I've seen people do. Do not tell the press you have got into a festival before the festival has made the announcement. They will kick you out of the festival. End of story. I've had people tell me like. Oh, I got into it. La, 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 la. I was oh, because they will kick you out. And I've seen this happen. Filmmakers have gone, I don't know what happened. It's like you told somebody and it got back to them. It's like, you know, it's embargoed. It's embargoed for a reason. Do not think you know better than the festival because you really don't. And, they, and it's their rules. And they will kick you out. Uh, but yeah, I'd say announcing you've gone to a festival. Uh, any kind of distribution deal. If you've been acquired by somebody, absolutely. Or if you're going to self-distribution, then the point where, self you, where you're going on Amazon or you've got a BOD deal, uh, even if it's with a, small, with a small BOD house, then those are good points to go, hey, we're doing that. Or if you're doing a short, um, quite often people will go, OK, it's done the festival circuit for two years. I'll finally put it online once I've burned all my festival time out. That's a good time to say, hey, we're online now. You know, just do a quick reach out to say, you can find it here. Those can be really, really quick, simple emails. 
Uh, you'll have the full press release from when you've done it before in the cycle, so just send that out. But those are, that's a really good time, particularly, again, because it's a quick and easy piece of reporting for the journalist to go, hey, this really cool short that played such and such a festival, it's online now, you can watch it, and they'll embed it which really helps them because say you've got a 10 minute short, they've embedded it on their site, it means somebody is on their page for 10 minutes, which fits into all kinds of, of ability to sell advertising because they can get people with staying with us. That really helps them. So that makes them happy because that makes the editors happy because that makes sales happy. But yeah, any point where you've got something that you've really got to say this is relevant. It's big events, not just we've hired somebody Oh, we've cast somebody. Unless it's like you're a small production and you've cast a really big name. Um, Dean Cain's PR people love telling me when he's been hired to something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why, but there's quite often I'll say, Dean Cain is very good. I'm not a sign of coffee. Um, I'm sure he's a very nice guy, but no, we're good. Uh, okay, any more questions? For a short film, would you suggest a trailer? Still? Um, that depends. Um, if you're going into the festival circuit, yeah. Uh, that still can be a really good one. It's anything that gets somebody that gets a journalist's attention and that they can spread out. And you can do I mean, trailers for short films, they can be 30 seconds. They can, they can be real teasers rather than a full, a full trailer. Um, but yeah, quite a, yeah I, I like those as well. Um, and again, if you're in the editing bay anyway, they're not going to be, you know, it's a little bit more effort. Uh, you can pay somebody to put your trail together for you. There's a couple of people in town, that's all they do. Um, Greg McClellan, uh, who used to be with the Draft House, he's now Electric Owl. Um, that's all Greg does, is, is cut trails now, really. Um, so, Sometimes going and paying the money for a trailer to be cut, in particular a feature, I think is a good investment. And then telling journalists you have a trailer, that's another good point. Uh, you were talking about films. What about like television? What if someone's doing a pilot or their local TV series or something? Uh, yeah. You said web series a uh, moment. Or that's something. a lot, yeah. Um, well, now everybody's, you think, the term is episodics. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because nobody knows what to call them anymore. Um, again, I would say if you're going into production, that's, you know, just tell us you're going into production, that's a good time for outreach. Um, if it's a web series, when are you first going online? If it's getting some kind of either digital or terrestrial broadcast, or you're going through some kind of streaming service, you'll know the date pretty far ahead. So again, say, okay, well, we've done a series for pull the service out of the air, shudder. Or we've got something and it's going to be on K, uh, uh, KBRX in six months' time. Let us know. It works very much the same way. It's like, is this a time when it is good for me to be, told, to be telling journalists about this? Sometimes you just want to put it on their radar and say, okay, we're, you know, we've been acquired by Shutter, we'll be, yeah, it'll be streaming third quarter of 2019. And they're like, oh, okay, yeah, I'll keep an eye out for that. You may not be necessarily be getting something at that moment, but you're on their radar. And you may not get that first moment of coverage, but it's a press release where you can go, okay, this is forewarning. And that's the difference between that and just something like, We've hired Dean Kane for the fifteen thousand. <laughs> <laughs> to that end, we're going into production on a, a new series called Big League Texas Rescue. It's about dog rescue in Dallas, Houston, San Antonio. Um, do you get involved in the process when producers want to reach out to the community and, and involve people in the casting process? Um, sometimes yes. Um, it almost depends. And again, that's a reaching out to the right publication. Uh, I've been looking to do more on casting calls, but a lot of that's done by casting agents, but on smaller, on smaller uh, projects. Sometimes, yes, particularly if it's anything where you really are reaching out to the community, it's not a PR thing. If right. it's really like, we want people to come in and tell us their stories, then yes, 
that's something where we can go, okay, and we get those once in a while, like, uh, okay, the, you know, such and such a show is shooting in Austin, they're looking for people with relevant stories, you know, um, Ink Masters came through a couple of years ago, and you know, we did some pre-coverage on that, and then talked to them when they were actually in town. So that's kind of the first milestone, and then when we come out, you probably hit it again. And yeah. And again, it's the first con it, it's a first contact, and you may not get something right then, but you're on their radar, and that's the two things. Is like you got to think about it. Like, am I trying to get a story, or am I just trying to make them know I exist? And you know, it's that slide of like, hey, you know, hey, I have a film. Sometimes that's a good thing. You're not going to get coverage of it necessarily, but sometimes that's a good thing to just go, hey, we started production just to let you know. You're more likely to get it if, if you hit all those points of relevance of like, I've got it coming out, and it's arriving in, t in a month's time, and it's opening in Austin, and we're going to have something at Violet Crowd or at AFS. You may want to know about that, but again, that's one of those things of give people time to think, is this something I need to prioritize my time? Because, and here's, this isn't me complaining. Um, most film journalists are pretty overworked. Um, so the more time you give them to know, okay, we're doing a project, the, the easier it makes their life because they can plan ahead. Uh, you know, in the Chronicle, we've got one of the bigger teams in town, but we're still really stretched because Austin is a film town. And I keep telling people this, and they go, you're a music town, and I go, Shut up. You've got, awesome. got as many Oscars as Grammys. Uh, Ethan Hawke's from here. True story. He actually was, uh, he, he was happy last year because he got on the cover of the Chronicle. And I've been talking to him about that beforehand. And he was like, Greg Linklater has been on the cover like 10 times. He's yeah. from Houston. <laughs> what am I going to do? We turned out all we had to do with Bait Blaze. Uh, so. Any more questions? I had one, I just forgot it. Oh, I just like to it. it goes back to me. I'll, I'll ask you. Well, uh, I'll be around uh, for a few minutes more. I think we've got the room to like 8.30. Thank you so much for coming out. I really appreciate it.